If you love playing paladins in D&D, or if you love playing protector tank type characters, or you know what, if you just love kenders, then you just might love this video, and I hope you'll watch. Welcome to D4. Hey everybody, so here at D4, each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for our favorite tabletop role-playing games. We crunch numbers about the build, we theorycraft about it, not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way to play a certain character, but to explore one potential way for building a character in the hopes of creating something that is both really fun, but also really powerful to play. So if you enjoy creating characters for your favorite role-playing games almost as much as you enjoy Enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on how to build a character that you're thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong. It really is. I'm so glad you're here. So thanks for being here. My name's Colby. Really quick. If you would be interested in getting a written step-by-step -step, like cheat sheet to help you recreate this character for yourself without having to go back and rewatch the video or take notes, or if you're just looking for a way to lend some additional support to the channel, then I would really appreciate it if you'd consider joining as a member. There's a little button down there. It says join for just $2 a month. You get access to the library of write-ups that I create for each one of these builds. To save yourself a little bit of time, it's a huge support and benefit to me, so I want to give a big shout out to all of my channel members. You guys are amazing. Couldn't do this without you. And for everybody else, you're also amazing. And I couldn't do it without you either. Just watching and liking and subscribing and commenting are all fantastic ways to support the channel too. I'm just glad you're here. We interrupt this character build to bring you a word from our sponsor, Bloodline Heroes of Lythus. This game has one of the most unique gameplay mechanics I've ever seen in a mobile game. It's cool. First off though, some things to know. Heroes of Lythus is free to download and play. You can get there by scanning this QR code right here or by going to the link that I will put in the video description. Using those links gets you a free starter pack of in-game items worth 20 bucks. Not only that, but Bloodline is celebrating their anniversary in June, so now is the best time to start playing the game as they're giving away tons of rewards all month long, including 10 free summons, 3,000 diamonds, and a lot more just for logging in every day. Here's how the game works. You gather champions, you battle with them, level them up, but then you also collect new bloodlines every couple of weeks and can then customize them by marrying any two bloodlines to create over a thousand fantasy hybrids and endless possibilities for your lineup strategies. So you can get new characters for your party not only by summoning them, but also by, well, making a family together. Oh. Check out the newest bloodlines just released. The Titan Warriors, who are the enforcers of the Iron Will of Olympus, and the Nine-Tailed Vulpins, who come from an eastern land of mysterious power. In-game, you'll deploy your team of hybrids into a vast and realistic fantasy world with really gorgeous visuals, actually, I must say. Hybrids inherit not only the talents and traits of their parents, but also their unique appearances. You can, of course, also purchase new skins with sleek designs to further customize your champions. Once you get into late game with your champions, there is a rewarding PvP system where all players can obtain uniquely designed hybrid champions, Bloodcraft Legends, by earning points in seasonal guild wars. So, raise heirs with companions, who, by the way, can have their gender switched freely, build your own kingdom and economy with strategic gameplay, and enjoy beautiful scenes and interesting storylines by checking out Bloodline Heroes of Lythus now. Again, scan the QR code or follow the link in the video description to download it for free on both Android and iOS. Doing so is gonna get you the anniversary starter pack worth 20 bucks, which will give you a random champion, a summoning crystal, 100,000 gold, thank you very much, and 100 diamonds. Finally, and importantly, the first 30 players to leave their in-game account ID and username in the pinned comment comment down below in the comment section, we'll get a free legendary female titan warrior. Nice. All right, big thanks to Bloodline Heroes of Lythus. Let's get back to the episode. As longtime viewers of my channel know, I love building tank characters, characters who are super hard to kill. They're one of my favorite kinds of character to both build and play in any role-playing game, actually. Second only, I think, to like an agile striker. But here is a philosophical question for you. At the end of the day, why do we build tank characters, these 
burly, hard to kill protector types. I mean, I suppose some of us do it just because we like being hard to kill. And there's some value there, no question, but I'd be willing to bet that for most of us, it's so that we can protect our allies. That's kind of the point of being a tank, right? To keep our allies safe, usually by getting the enemy to hit us instead of them. As I've said like a billion times in past videos, we're not really a tank if all we're doing is making ourselves hard to kill, right? Alas, there are not that many ways to just force an enemy to attack you instead of your friends in D&D 5e. I mean, actually, if I'm being honest, I think that's a good thing, generally speaking, but it does make it a little challenging to draw enemy fire and thus tank for our friends, right? The way I usually try to fulfill that goal is by taking one of three subclasses in the game. The Armorer Artificer, the Ancestral Guardian Barbarian, or the Cavalier Fighter, all of whom have a enemies you hit have disadvantage if they try to attack anyone but you feature. The big problem with having to pay that sort of tank tax, I guess, is that it means three levels dipped into a class that you might not otherwise want to take. Enter the Kender. Kenders were a race introduced to 5e relatively recently with the Dragonlance Shadow of the Dragon Queen book. As an aside, I loved all things Dragonlance when I was a kid. I devoured pretty much every Dragonlance book that came out for a few years there, and Tasselhoff Burfoot, a Kender, was one of my favorite characters in the series, no doubt. So yes, as soon as Kenders became an official race, I've been looking forward to building a character around them. The most compelling mechanical feature of Kenders, in my opinion, is their taunt feature. It lets us do the thing that I'm always trying to do in my tank builds, right? Let you encourage enemies to attack you instead of your allies by giving those enemies disadvantage if they try to attack anyone but you. Awesome. Now, to be fair, this taunt that Kenders get isn't nearly as reliable as the like soft taunt of those sub races I mentioned earlier, right? Those work potentially every single turn so long as you make a successful melee attack against an enemy. The Kender taunt only works proficiency bonus times per day for one round on a single enemy. That bums me out so badly that I've delayed building around Kenders for many, many months despite my initial excitement when they were first introduced. And yet, I've built tanks before that had a slightly less reliable taunt. The Dampier uh, Vampire tank, right, for one, or the um, Battlesmith's Defender, who relied on their pet to tank for them. They got a kind of a taunt, but it was fairly limited. It's not to say that you can't still make this work, and frankly, applying this disadvantage is never a guarantee that an enemy is going to attack you and not your friends. And plenty of times you might miss your attack or suffer other restrictions on that taunt. Like in the Cavalier's case, the enemy has to stay within five feet of you for it to work, right? Ancestral Guardian Barbarians can only taunt one enemy per round. So I decided this week to take the plunge and try to build a Kender tank, despite the relative infrequency with which you'll be able to use that taunt. Because the idea of being able to taunt enemies, at least some of the time, without having to dip three levels into a different class, really opens up some possibilities for making a great tank character that we otherwise can't really do. So at this point then, the question becomes, if we were going to focus on building a character who above all was trying to protect our allies, and we could just go with a single class without needing to multi-class, what class should we go for? I mean, I think the answer has to be Paladin, right? doesn't it? Don't get me wrong, I love building around the Abjuration Wizard and Clockwork Soul Sorcerer for tanking as much as the next person, but again, if the goal of the tank isn't just to be hard to kill and protect themselves, but to actually protect their team, it's hard to argue that any class does it better than the Paladin. Of course, Paladins don't innately get a taunt feature, none of the subclasses do. Something that I really felt was lacking when I first tried to build a Paladin tank many moons ago. So here's my perfect opportunity to make a true paladin tank, one who requires no multiclassing so they can get to all of their fantastic protection focused abilities as soon as possible, as well as scale their wonderful survival and protection features and spells as high as possible and still be able to taunt at least once in a while to help them keep their friends safe. And so 
I proudly present D&D build number 138, the Kender Tank, the Ancients Pally Tankadon. How about Nature's Guardian? Huge thanks to my good friend Randall Hampton for the fantastic artwork that he created for this character concept. I love what he comes up with each and every week. If you'd be interested in following him on social media to check out the other stuff that he's done or to reach out and see if you can commission him to create some art for your character or your entire party, I will put links in the video description as always on how to do so. All right, at level one for our starting class, yes, we are starting out as a paladin. Hooray! <laughs> if I'm being honest, I think Paladin might be the hardest class to multi-class out of in D&D 5e. Maybe with the exception of Wizard, I guess. And unless, of course, I'm just dipping into Paladin for Divine Smite. There are just so many wonderful features and scaling with Paladin, and once you start, it's really hard to justify getting out, at least until level six or seven, I think. And of course, with most campaigns at most tables, ending around level 10 or so, Level six, level seven, that's the majority of most characters' career, right? Anyway, yes, when we first meet our champion, I think they are a devotee of a deity with a strong tie to nature and the natural world. I might even go one step further and say we are a servant of like a moon deity, say Selune or Solinari or Ayelastrayi, but We'll see why in a bit. As for our starting race, yes, we're going Kender, like I've said. Kenders are small in size, and they have some really nice features, including Fearless, which not only gives you advantage on saving throws to avoid or end the frightened condition on yourself, but also lets you, once per day, just straight up succeed on a save to avoid or end the frightened condition if you fail. That's super useful and also totally on point for Kenders in the lore who seem to just never feel fear for the most part. Most importantly, of course, for us is the taunt feature, which tells us that proficiency bonus times per day and as a bonus action, we can unleash a string of provoking words at a creature within 60 feet of us nice range, and if they fail a wisdom saving throw, then they have disadvantage on attacks against anyone but us until the start of our next turn. I wish this were a charisma saving throw. I wish it lasted for longer than one round. I wish we could use it more often. But this is what we have to work with, so I'm going to assume that you are making good use of it to protect your most vulnerable allies against your most dangerous enemies. Also, the DC of the save is based on either your wisdom, intelligence, or charisma, and we'll choose charisma, of course, being a paladin. Anecdotally, what's funny to me about this ability is it seems like in the books, more often than not, Tasselhoff was using his taunt ability against his friend Flint, uh, rather than against their enemies. Still, I love the feature, and I would strongly encourage you also, if you're going to play a Kender, please keep a good slew of insults on hand to use, not only when you're actually taunting and using your taunt feature, right, but just to throw out there, like, almost every turn to try and goad your enemy into attacking you anyway. Find a good, like, random insult generator. Keep it handy. It's what any good Kender would do. And hey, every once in a while, it just might convince your DM, uh, I mean, the monsters, to attack you despite there being no like mechanical or tactical reason to do so. As for our ability scores, I assume that we're going the point by method as always, and recommend taking a 15 strength, a 15 constitution and a plus two there, and then a 15 charisma and a plus one there. Now, the reality is, if I were playing this character in game, I'd probably go a slightly different route here. I think I'd likely end up going a plus two to strength, just a 14 constitution, leaving it there, you know, plus nothing, and then still a 15 charisma plus one. The route I'm suggesting here instead will be better for our survivability, and as one who is beholden to the spreadsheets, maximizing survivability in an effort to explore the realm of what's possible from a defensive survivability standpoint, this is what I feel compelled to do. Feel free to emphasize your strength instead if you'd like, or, you know, even maximize your charisma. As for starting equipment, I'm just gonna say let's grab some chainmail, a shield, and your favorite D8 weapon. Nothing too fancy here, just standard stuff. As a Paladin 1, then we get first up Divine Sense. This lets us use an action to detect undead fiends or celestials within 60 feet of us who are not behind total cover. We can do this one plus charisma modifier times per day. It'll come in handy once in a while. But then we also get the fantastically wonderful Lay on Hands. This is one of the main reasons that I'm so happy that I don't need three levels in another class in order to tank, because Lay on Hands 
scales about as well as any ability in all of D&D 5e. It gives us five Lay on Hands points per Paladin level, and those points can then be used as an action to heal one hit point per point spent. And yes, you better believe that when I'm crunching numbers, I'm going to assume that we're blowing all of those on ourselves to stay alive, though of course in-game you will more likely be using them to heal your squishier allies. We can also spend five Lay on Hands points to cure a poison or disease. At level two, we get that most favorite of Paladin features, Divine Smite, that I'm not even building around this week. Divine Smite tells us that when we hit with a melee weapon attack, we can spend a spell slot to do an extra 2d8 radiant damage, plus 1d8 more for each spell slot above first that we spend. On this character, I'd probably only make use of Divine Smite sparingly saving it for like when I get a critical hit, or maybe if I'm really confident that an enemy is like this close to death and adding a Divine Smite would be the difference maker, right? It's still a useful and fun tool to have. We also get a fighting style, and again, there's probably a difference here in what I'm going to tell you to take to maximize your survivability and what I'd probably take if I were playing this character in game. The defense fighting style straight up just raises our AC by one, so let's take that route in the name of being hard to kill, but yeah, if our number one goal with this character is to protect our friends, we'll want to take interception instead, which lets us use our reaction to reduce damage to an ally within five feet of us when they get hit, right? And that's just way better as a protection-focused character, who's already going to be really tough to kill. And then we get Paladin spells here, and similarly, you'd probably want to be casting Bless for your concentration to give up to three party members an extra d4 on all of their attack rolls and saving throws, but in the name of survivability, I'm going to assume that we're using Shield of Faith here for our concentration to give ourselves a plus two to defense. And you might actually want to do that some of the time, especially if someone else in the party is using Bless, right? But otherwise, yeah, I'd probably be focusing on Bless once I got this character out of the vacuum slash lab that I'm building them in here, yeah. Other spells to consider though here are Cure Wounds for some additional healing, especially if we're out of Lay on Hands points, right? Command gives us potentially a nice bit of control, forcing an enemy to flee or grovel, go prone, you know, throw themselves out of a window even. What's the word for that again? But maybe most importantly here would be the Compelled Duel spell. This is another potential soft taunt for our character, and considering we've only got the Kender taunt otherwise, you might actually want to use this semi-frequently. Similar to that Kender taunt, you cast it as a bonus action, you can do so from range, though it's 30 feet, not 60, and the enemy gets to make a wisdom save against it. If they fail, they have disadvantage on attacks against anyone but you, and they have to make a wisdom save if they try to move more than 30 feet away from you. The biggest downside to this spell is that it requires concentration. Other downsides are that the spell ends if you attack anyone else, cast a harmful spell on anyone else, or if one of your friends harms or casts a harmful spell on your compelled dual target. Lots of restrictions, but it does last for a full minute, so you could always cast it on one enemy, telling your allies to just leave this one to me, right? And then even throw out your Kender taunt occasionally on a different enemy if need be, and that's a nice option to have. At level three, I know I've been gushing about not having to multi-class out of Paladin, <laughs> but I'm actually going to make some of you very annoyed and take one very small, very quick multi-class detour here. You don't have to. Feel free to stay Paladin if you want, or if your DM doesn't allow multi-classing or something. The truth is, we're really only doing this for one main reason, and it's to get access to the shield spell. Now, to be fair, there are a great number of ways that we could get access to shield. The Magic Initiate feat, or Mark of Sentinel Human, but in both cases we could only use the spell once per day, which is lame, plus we want to be a Kender, not a human. A Wizard Dip? would get us there, or worse yet, three levels into Artificer, but then we would need a 13 Intelligence, which I don't love. Arguably, the best mechanical path for us here would be, yeah, to go a single level of Hexblade. This would not only get us the Shield Spell, but also, of course, let us use our Charisma modifier for our plus to hit and damage, letting us largely ignore our Strength score. I strongly considered going that route, and would not fault you in the least for doing so. I might actually do this if I were playing the character in game myself. But in the end, we're going to eventually be taking a half feat that bumps our strength. We needed a 13 strength for Paladin. I hated feeling like that half feat we're going to be taking is wasted. But more than that, I just get a little tired of Hexblade dips. <laughs> and this character felt like the perfect time 
to get a certain subclass of sorcerer that I've never used before. So that is what we're going to do instead, making us then a sorcerer one here. And as a sorcerer one, we get our sorceress origin, our sorcerer subclass. And I think on this build, we've got to go lunar sorcery, right? I mean, it's the only subclass to come out of that Dragonlance book, and how could we not pair them with the only race to come out of that book as well? As an aside, for those of you complaining that I should be taking Dragonlance backgrounds here too, I mean, if it's allowed at your table, especially I assume if you're playing in a specific campaign that takes place in like the world of Kryn where everyone has access to those backgrounds, then sure, feel free to become a Squire of Solomnia or an Initiate of High Sorcery. I'd probably go with the latter to pick up that shield spell so we could avoid multi-classing altogether. I've decided to avoid these backgrounds in my builds for the same reason that I avoid the Ravnica backgrounds, right? They're way too powerful and most tables don't allow them unless they're playing specifically in that world, which means most of you won't be able to use them and I want to build this character in a way that most of you will actually be able to replicate. Anyway, let's learn a little bit about Lunar Sorcerers, shall we? You or someone from your lineage has been exposed to the concentrated magic magic of the moon or moons of your world, imbuing you with lunar magic. Perhaps your ancestor was involved in a druidic ritual involving an eclipse, or maybe a mystical fragment of a moon crashed near you. However you came to have your magic, your connection to the moon is obvious when you cast sorcerer spells perhaps making your pupils glow with the color of a moon from your world, causing spectral manifestations of lunar phases to orbit you, or some other effect. I thought this level here at level 3 might be a great time in our story to take this level dip since we just started manifesting spellcasting, right, with Paladin 2. Here I think we could pretty easily make this work in our character story as the lunar deity that we serve is just giving us an increase of their magical power to further our ability to champion their cause. Feel free to do something more elaborate in your backstory if you really want to. But as a lunar sorcerer then, we get lunar spells. This simply gives us, at this level, three additional spells for free. Now, at the end of a long rest, we can choose what lunar phase manifests its power through us. Full moon, new moon, or crescent moon. And then when we're in that phase, we can cast the associated first level spell without spending a spell slot once per day. I assume then that we'd pretty much just always be in the full moon phase as that's the one tied to the shield spell and being able to cast it once per day for free is wonderful. Especially since we are mostly going to be a half caster paladin with fewer spell slots, right? Hey guys, just editing and realizing that I kind of failed to talk about here like I so often do when I build a character who's either using two weapons or a weapon and a shield and that's a failure to talk about the warcaster feed. We, we don't end up getting Warcaster on this build, and I appreciate that though Paladin spells should generally not be too difficult for us to cast because we can put a holy symbol on our shield and thereby meet the somatic and material components for our Paladin spells because the rules also state that you can use the same hand for your somatic component as for your material components, right? Or is that the other way around? Anyway, since shield is a sorcerer spell, that doesn't work, right? And so if we were to cast it, and because it has a somatic component, rules as written, we would need a free hand in order to cast shield. I often forget that not everybody plays this way at my table. As part of the reaction to cast the shield spell, you can drop a sword or whatever. Then you just need to pick it up on your next turn, right? If you can't do that at your table, then yes, you're either going to need Warcaster or just skip this level in sorcerer to not worry about the shield spell, basically. Stupid Warcaster tax. As for the other first level spells and cantrips we get access to as a Sorcerer 1 here, I'm just gonna say make sure to grab Absorb Elements so that we can gain resistance to elemental damage, right? Fire, Lightning, Cold, Thunder, Acid with our reaction. Other than that, go ahead and pick your favorites. Nothing else here that we'll plan on using for tanking purposes, so you know, I'd probably be focusing on utility and support stuff with maybe a firebolt thrown in there for a decent ranged attack if you need one. But at level four, I'm going back to Paladin, meaning that we would be a Paladin 3, and this gives us Divine Health, which simply makes us immune to all disease. In my experience, disease doesn't come up all that often in a typical campaign, but when diseases do come up, they can be pretty nasty. So this will be great in those instances. Question of the day. What is the worst disease that you ever saw someone at your table get in a D&D game? My Pathfinder character got flypox once. 
That was gross. But then we also at Pally 3 get our Paladin subclass here, our Sacred Oath. And I mean, I guess I kind of spoiled it with the thumbnail. I always do that. <laughs> anyway, yes, we are going with the Oath of the Ancients. I don't think I've actually ever gone with this oath in a build before, have I? I know I've talked about it as a potential alternative. Anyway, if that's true, it's kind of shocking because, to be honest, I think it's the best paladin subclass in the game if you're primarily concerned with protecting your allies. Oath of the Crown has some really good stuff in it as well, but I really don't like the limitations you get on your channel divinity options with that oath, and I prefer the level 7 feature on the Ancients Pally. Anyway, let's learn about the Oath of the Ancients, shall we? The Oath of the Ancients is as old as the race of elves and the rituals of the druids. Sometimes called Fey Knights, Green Knights, or Horned Knights, Paladins who swear this oath cast their lot with the side of the light in the cosmic struggle against darkness, because they love the beautiful and life-giving things of the world, not necessarily because they believe in principles of honor, courage, and justice. They adorn their armor and clothing with images of growing things, leaves, antlers, or flowers, to reflect their commitment to preserving life and light in the world. Alright, so we're definitely channeling that lover of nature vibe here, which I really enjoy. Though, again, for me, I think this would be a little less like antlers on my helm and maybe a little more imagery of the moon, maybe a crescent on my shield and pauldrons or something like that. Regardless, as an Ancient's Paladin, first up we get Oath Spells, which are just added to our list of spells known for free. For us, that means Ensnaring Strike, which is actually a pretty great spell and is typically only available to rangers. Like the Paladin Smite smells, Thunderous Smite, etc., you cast it as a bonus action, and it unfortunately requires our concentration. Afterwards, though, the next time you hit a creature with a weapon attack, they are restrained by thorny vines and take some extra damage unless they make a strength saving throw. Better yet, they take extra damage and stay restrained for a whole minute unless they or an ally use their action to make a strength check against our spell DC. No, they get to save every round or anything like that, and that's great, since even if they succeed on that strength check, they still had to waste their turn breaking out, right? I can definitely see a damage-focused build around this spell. Excuse me one moment while I add that to my to-do list. Uh, Ancient Paladins also get a Speak with Animals for free, which can provide a nice bit of utility. And we also get Channel Divinity at this level, just like Clerics, right? And this allows us to, once per short rest, do one of three things. All Paladins can harness Divine Power once per day, letting us recover a spent spell slot. And then Ancient Paladins get two options for Channel Divinity unique to them. Nature's Wrath lets us spend an action to attempt to restrain creatures within 10 feet of us with more vines. The tough part about this for us is that the enemies get to choose to make either a Strength or Dexterity save to avoid it, and they get to make that saving throw at the end of each turn. Once they succeed, the vines vanish. It's a fairly small area, right? Just 10 feet from us in every direction. It seems to me like enemies succeed here more often than not. but it's it will be useful once in a while. Interestingly, there's no duration listed here, so theoretically these vines could last forever as long as the enemy just continued to fail their saving throw. We also get Turn the Faithless as an option for our channel divinity, which is like the cleric's Turn Undead, but it works on Fey and Fiends instead. If the enemies fail a wisdom save, they have to spend their turns running away from you, right? Here's hoping you run into swarms of Fey or Fiends once in a while with low wisdom saves. At level 5, we would be a Paladin 4, and that means we get our first ability score increase or feat. And we've got a 17 constitution on a character who's trying to maximize survivability above all else. So that means we need a good half feat that will let us bump our constitution by one. And you know what that means. That's right, we're going to culinary school because we are taking Chef. Chef is one of my absolute favorite feats in the game. There's just so much wholesomeness here. I can't get enough. It gives us two main abilities. First, during a short rest, we can cook food to feed our friends that lets them regain an extra d8 of hit points if they spent hit dice during that short rest. But even better, we get to make treats. <laughs> yeah, at the end of a long rest, we can make proficiency bonus number of treats that last eight hours. By the way, I really wish they would make like everything that lasted eight hours in 5e just last 16 hours, or maybe until your next long rest or something. It's just so clunky to be like, well, let's see, we woke up at 7 a.m. I cast that spell at 8, now it's 4 p.m. So sorry, your aid has expired, or these treats have gone bad, or my mage armor wore off, etc. Anyway, 
Anyone who eats one of these treats as a bonus action gets temporary hit points equal to our proficiency bonus. That's so cute. I've said before that I like to play tanks because it just like lets me channel my dad energy, right? This just takes it to level 11. Now I'm protecting and feeding you? Best parent ever. Of course, in the interest of seeing how far we can stretch our own survivability, I'm going to pretend that we're just greedily hoarding all of our delicious chocolate chip cookies for ourselves and like munching on one every time we run out of temporary hit points until they're all gone. No good parent would ever do this, but I'm just exploring the limits of what's possible here. Don't hate me for it. At level 6, we would be a Paladin 5, and that means we get extra attack. So now we can make two attacks instead of one when we take the attack action. We're not building for damage on this character, but this will be a nice option for when we are trying to help our allies take down our foes. We also get second level Paladin spells here. First up, Ancient's Paladins get Misty Step and Moonbeam for free, and those are both pretty fantastic options. Maybe the best second level spell options of any Paladin, I might argue. Misty Step is especially nice, as teleporting is pretty tough to come by for Paladins, who don't take a racial feature to give them a teleport option, right? And Moonbeam can be a pretty solid spell, as I think we demonstrated with the Cosmic Controller last week, if you use it right. Again, not something that we're building around here, but no reason why you couldn't. You could focus Focus on strength and start grappling with this build if you want it, and then start pushing enemies into Moonbeam and pulling them out and pushing them back in. Anyway, other than those spells, I'd be sure to grab Aid, of course, for a nice heal and max hit point bump for three party members, including ourselves, of course. I'd get Lesser Restoration for some nice curing capabilities, and then I think you kind of have to take Fine Steed as a Paladin, just because it's so iconic, and who wouldn't want a free Warhorse? Okay, at level 6, it's time for our first damage report. For those new to the channel, this is how we calculate damage numbers against our tank builds. For everybody else, feel free to skip ahead like 90 seconds or so. We pit our tanks against three hypothetical combat encounters of medium difficulty for a party of four at this level. One is like a boss fight against a dragon, one is a typical fight against four or five like normal-ish enemies that you might find yourself fighting at this level, and the third is just a level appropriate fireball. We figure out how much damage our tank would take if they had access to all of their resources, a spell slot for aid, a spell slot for shield, etc. That number is our DTPR, damage taken per round. We then determine how long our tank would survive if they took that exact amount of damage every single round, again, assuming they have access to all their resources, all their treats, all of their lay on hands points, etc. right? That then gives us our rounds to die, or RTD. It's a flawed model. You might not have any spell slots left for every single fight, right? or only 10 lay on hands points left instead of whatever your maximum amount is at that level. But as I do with all my builds, I like to calculate numbers based on best case scenario in the interest of exploring what's possible, mechanically speaking, for each character. Also, of course, every enemy on the battlefield is very unlikely to spend their entire turn attacking you and only you round after round, right? That'd be awesome if they did, but it's pretty unlikely. The model then is imperfect but serviceable so long as we apply it to every single tank character we build, which we have done right now with a shield and a plus one to armor class from the defense fighting style, using our concentration for shield of faith, and assuming we've managed to get plate mail armor, our AC is a fantastic 23. If we have a spell slot for the shield spell, it's an incredible 28. With an 18 constitution, three treats that give three temporary hit points each, 25 lay on hands points, and assuming we've got aid cast on ourselves, we'd have a total potential pool of a whopping 101 hit points that an enemy would have to burn through before we keeled over. That's a ton at level six. Again, and as always, we're talking best case scenario for damage taken in a round, then calculating how long we'd survive at that level of damage. It's not really an attempt to figure out how long it would take this character to actually die because we're working in a vacuum and every combat encounter is different. Anyway, at this level, our boss fight here was a young white dragon, and if they just bit and clawed us for their turn and only us, we would on average take 4 damage in a round, and at that rate of damage we'd survive for 29 rounds. The typical fight was against 4 berserkers, and our DTPR there was 3, and our RTD was 32, and then against a level 3 DC 14 fireball, we would take 10 damage in a round, and at that rate we'd survive for 11 rounds. And thank goodness for absorb elements, because our deck save is a minus one. Regardless, compared to other tank characters that I've built to date at this level, 
That's right near the top of tier one across all three hypothetical encounters. And I don't think any of them had extra attack by this level. Man, it is nice to be able to go almost exclusively single class when you are a paladin focused on protecting your allies and being hard to kill. Oh, and it's about to get a whole lot better. Because at level seven, we'd be a paladin six. And yes, that means the one, the only aura of protection. And this truly is one of, if not the best protective abilities in all of D&D 5e. It simply adds your charisma modifier to every saving throw that you and any of your allies within 10 feet of you make. Now, I'll be honest, as great as this ability is, I kind of wish that it were maybe a little less potent, but affected a larger area. What if it were like half of your proficiency bonus rounded up, but in a 30 foot aura? I know it gets to 30 feet eventually, but not until level 18, and most of us are never gonna get to level 18 on a character, right? 10 feet, it's just a, such a small aura. It'll be rare that you'll have all of your allies within the range, and that's just kinda too bad. Maybe they could keep it at 10, but just let it scale by an additional five feet every few levels until it caps at 30 feet at level 18. Why not? That would be better. It keeps incentivizing me to put levels into Paladin after level six. Hurry, go fill out the 1D&D Paladin feedback survey and make the suggestion, unless it's too late. In which case, just fill out whatever survey they have available and mention it there. <laughs> but level eight is almost as great because, well, that rhymed. <laughs> because we would be a Paladin seven, and that means as an Ancient's Pally, we get Aura of Warding. And this Aura gives you and all of your friends within 10 feet resistance to the damage from all spells. That's pretty stellar, really. And is the reason why I think Ancient's Paladins are the best protection-based Paladin in game. No more need for Absorb Elements unless you're going up against dragon fire or something. And it works on all spell damage, not just elemental damage. Combine this with our vastly improved saving throws from Aura of Protection, and we just gave ourselves and our friends a pretty massive defensive bump. At level nine, we would be a pally eight, and that means we get another ability score increase or feat. And I think we should take heavy armor master here. I mean, there is actually a strong argument for just bumping charisma to give us, to give us the most out of our Aura of Protection, right? not to mention increase our spellcasting and other pally features, but for pure survivability against most of the damage that we will be subjected to in game, a heavy armor master will do more for us. First off, it's a half feat, so we have a nice even 16 strength now. But then it also tells us that while wearing heavy armor, damage we take from non-magical, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage is reduced by three. And as a reminder, the vast majority of enemies in D&D 5e do bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, and almost none of it is considered magical, so this will apply to most of the damage that we take in game. It might not seem like a lot, just three, especially at character level nine, but it adds up to be more than you might think, especially when you're fighting a lot of enemies but who don't hit all that hard, right? Considering how infrequently our enemies will actually be hitting us, reducing that damage when they do manage to land an attack on us will be a really nice way for us to just add insult to injury. But for our level nine damage report, since last check, we've done wonders for our saving throws, especially if we're saving against magical damage, right? And added the very nice damage resistance from Heavy Armor Master as well. Our AC has remained the same, but our total hit point pool with more and better treats, a potential upcasting of aid to third level, thanks one level sorcerer dip, and more lay on hands points has grown to 158. And so against our boss here, which was a young blue dragon, if they just bit and clawed us for an entire round and we had access to our resources, we'd take five damage on average. And at that rate, we'd survive for 31 rounds. The typical fight was against four hobgoblin captains. The DTPR there was five as well, and the RTD was the same, 31. And then against a level four, 15 DC fireball, we would take 13 damage in a round, and at that rate, we'd survive for 12 rounds. And compared to other tank builds that I've done to date at this level, that comes down just a skosh compared to last time. We're kind of more like upper half of tier one, but not quite cream of the crop, still super solid and arguably doing more to protect our allies than a lot of those other builds, even if we were selfishly using our resources to just keep ourselves alive, which of course in an actual game, we're probably not gonna be doing. Share your treats. At level 10, we would be a Paladin 9, and that means we get third level Paladin spells. Ancients Pallies get plant growth for free, which is actually a pretty great control spell. 
It has an area of a 100 foot radius and all plants in the area become overgrown so that creatures moving in the area move at like one quarter move speed. Of course, it works a lot better if you're outside and not walking on pavement or anything. And it does affect friend and foe alike, but you can exclude as many like mini areas within that big 100 foot radius as you want. So it's pretty cool, pretty useful. Protection from energy is also free for us here. And that's mm, kind of cool. It gives a creature you touch resistance to one type of elemental damage for an hour, but it costs your concentration. And if they just stick close to you, they'd probably be just fine. So yeah, I don't see using this spell all that often. I mean, sure, there are things that do elemental damage that aren't considered spells, like I've said, right? Dragon breath attacks, etc. And those wouldn't benefit from our aura of warding. But still, a third level spell slot and concentration means we'd rarely be using this spell, if ever. As for the other spells we should consider here, I think we've got to go Aura of Vitality for the really fantastic out of combat healing it brings, if nothing else. But as a paladin, an Aura Master, eh, it's always fun to just throw out yet another Aura, right? To kind of heal your allies once on your turn with a bonus action. Dispel Magic, of course, is always handy, and Revivify is always good to have in a pinch if your ally kicks the bucket. Again, I am focused here on nurturing and protecting my allies above all else, yeah? At level 11, we would be a Paladin 10, and that means we get Aura of Courage. More Auras! I love it. Aura of Courage tells us that now, in addition to getting a bump to saves and resistance to spell damage, you and your friends within 10 feet cannot be frightened while you are conscious. Period. I mean, I guess that kind of makes the Kender Fearless trait a bit moot, but hey, it served us well for 10 levels. Maybe you could even play this in game like you've been working so hard on mastering or ignoring your fear that you finally just completely inoculated yourself to it. And your allies are so inspired by this, but they can't help but follow your lead and put on a brave face no matter what's trying to make them afraid as long as they stay close to you. At level 12, we would be a pally 11 and that means we get improved divine smite. And you know what? This is really a pretty nice feature. I mean, it's no third attack that fighters get at this level, but it's a lot better actually than what other supposedly martial damage focused characters might get at level 11. Looking at you, barbarian, rogue, monk, and none of those martial damage types get the incredible defensive and support capabilities that paladins get, right? With improved divine smite, whenever you hit a creature with a melee weapon, they take an extra d8 of radiant damage. Every hit. No need to spend resources at all. It's like a free spirit shroud spell without requiring concentration. I love it. At level 13, we would be a paladin 12, and that means another ability score increase or feat. And again, if we were truly focused on our own survivability above all else, we would want to take tough here to give us two more hit points per character level. We are one chonky kender. For our level 13 damage report, since last check, we've picked up some nice utility and protection focused abilities and spell options, as well as damage and even control capabilities. But the biggest increases to our own survivability have come in the form of a better proficiency bonus, upcasting aid at the fourth level, more lay on hands points, and that tough feat. Our armor class hasn't changed, but our total hit point pool, all self heals and self buffs considered, has gone up to a massive 258. Chonky chonk. And so against our boss fight here, which was an adult white dragon, the damage taken per round was nine, and at that rate, we would survive for 29 rounds. The typical fight was against five Helmed Horrors, and the DTPR against them was six, and the RTD was 43. And then against a level seven DC 16 Fireball, we would take 15 damage in a round, and at that rate, we would survive for 18 rounds. And compared to other tank builds that I've done to date at this level, Let's call that more kind of middle of the pack tier one. It's worse than most tier one builds against the dragon. It's better than most against the helmed horrors and the fireball. Point is, we're still incredibly hard to kill and capable of doling out a boatload of protection for our friends. At level 14, we would be a paladin 13, and that means fourth level paladin spells. Ancient's Pallies get Ice Storm for free, which is not bad. It's a kind of a mediocre bit of burst damage in an area of effect, but it also turns the area into difficult terrain. You'll probably find decent use for it once in a while. But then we also get something much better, for us at least, Stone Skin. For someone concerned about their own survivability who is not 
a Raging Barbarian, or an Earth Genasi, or a Shadar Kai that can fairly reliable grant themselves damage resistance, it is pretty dang sweet. It requires concentration, and it turns our skin as hard as stone for an hour, giving us resistance to, yep, non-magical, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. Going forward, I am going to assume that we're using this instead of Shield of Faith for our concentration, as it just makes the numbers look better. Most of the time, depending on what the enemy's plus to hit chance is. I mean, let's be honest, you probably haven't been using Shield of Faith for the most part, right, if you're actually playing this character in-game. Our AC has been so high that, especially if we have the shield spell available, a lot of enemies wouldn't be able to hit us unless they crit. We'll generally get more mileage out of resistance than we will a plus two to our armor class here. What's more, we also get access to Death Ward now. This is another one of those concentration-free eight-hour duration spells that give a creature we touch temporary immunity to death. The first time they would drop to zero hit points, they drop to one instead. Now, this is a little tough to factor numbers on. Most enemies by this point especially have multiple attack, and so they might drop you to zero hit points with their first hit, but instead you go to one and then they just hit you again, right? For ease of math, I'm just going to assume that it adds one round to our rounds to die. Though sometimes it won't add any rounds, but then sometimes it might add more if you can avoid getting hit and then heal yourself, or get healed by somebody else, or eat a treat and get some temporary hit points, right? I think the other spell that we've got to take here is find greater steed because that means we get a freaking griffin instead of that war horse and man i want to go into battle on a griffin so bad at level 15 we would be a pally 4 and that means we get cleansing touch which lets us use our action to just straight up end one spell on ourselves or someone else we touch no check or save or anything pretty potent when you really need it and we can do this charisma modifier times per day fantastic at level 16, we would be a Paladin 15, and that means we get Undying Sentinel. With Undying Sentinel, once per day, when we are reduced to zero hit points, we can just go to one hit point instead. So does that stack with Death Ward? Absolutely it stacks with Death Ward. Kind of makes me want to do a build where I just stack every single you drop to one hit point instead ability in the game just for fun and see how far we could push it. So yeah, sure, I will add another one to our RTD thanks to this next time I crunch numbers. And then finally for us, at level 17, we would be a Paladin 16, and that means we get another ability score increase or feat, and yes, in the name of survivability, I'm gonna bump our constitution here, taking it to the cap of 20, though again, in game, I might have been bumping strength all this time, or maybe even charisma. One thing we really don't need more of on this character is survivability, honestly, but you know me beholden to the spreadsheet. For our final damage report then, since last check, we've tacked on a couple of rounds of life thanks to our Undying Sentinel and Death Ward, we've capped our constitution, and we've given ourselves resistance to that bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage at the cost of a couple of points to our AC thanks to Stone Skin, right? We have also picked up more and better treats, more Lay on Hands points, and even the ability to upcast aid at the 5th level if we wanted to, thanks to multiclassing with that 1 level Sorcerer dip we have a 5th level spell slot right now. So yes, while our AC has dropped to 26, our total hit point pool has soared to a potential cap of 359, and we're going to have resistance to all the damage that I'm calculating for here like we were some sort of bear totem barbarian on steroids. But against our boss fight here, which was an adult red dragon, the damage taken per round was 11, and at that rate we would survive for 34 rounds. The typical fight was against five earth elementals, and the DTPR was also 11, but the RTD was 37, that was because of rounding on the DTPR. And then against not a fireball, but a meteor swarm, we're 17th level here, we're gonna take 51 damage per round on average, and at that rate, we would survive for 10 rounds. And compared to other tank builds that I've done to date at this level, it's near the top against the boss, middle of tier 1 against the elementals, and better than any tank I've ever built who did not have evasion, namely the rogue tank and the monk tank, versus that meteor swarm. Fan-freaking-tastic. So, Let's wrap it all up with some final thoughts. The tier score for this character, if you just take the rounds to die against every hypothetical encounter at each level that we did a damage report for and just averaged it all into one big number, we'd end up with a 26. 
and that puts us very near the top of tier one, just above the Warlock tank from a few weeks ago and right below the Swords Bard tank from several months back. But of course, the real question here is not what's their tier score, right? It should be how good of a job does this character do tanking for their allies? And sure, the reality is, without those levels in Armor Artificer or Ancestral Guardian Barbarian or Cavalier Fighter, we might not be the best tank ever at encouraging enemies to attack us. Even by end game, we can only use our Kender's Taunt six times a day. But of course, we could be throwing in some uses of Compelled Duel too at the cost of our armor class, and that would very often be worth it, as hard to hit as we are. That's not to say that the only motivation that enemies might have to attack us would be because we're taunting them either, right? We've got all of these auras going out, we're potentially buffing and healing our allies. Everybody knows the first person you target when you're in a fight is the healer. Unfortunately for our enemies, this healer just happens to be almost unkillable. You know, I actually played a paladin tank character in our Curse of Strahd campaign that my friend Cory was running for us a couple of years ago, and it was so dang fun. I think I might have told this story in a video before, but even though I didn't have any soft taunt abilities on that character, right? outside of Compelled Duel anyway, I was a fallen ASMR, not a Kender. There was this moment in game where I just ran into the middle of like 10 or 12 enemies and just shouted out a challenge to them while telling my allies to like run for safety. And to my DM, Corey's everlasting credit, he just went with it. And for four or five glorious rounds, I got to hold the line for my party while they hightailed it to safety. And this horde of enemies just wailed on me, or at least tried to. Most of them just kept missing. Eventually, yes, they brought me down, but it was hands down one of the most memorable and fun moments I have ever had in a game of D&D. So DMs, here's a little favor to ask. Once every so often, have a combat encounter that is just made to make your players feel really awesome. That lets them take the thing that they have built their character to be really good at and just let them be really amazing doing that thing. I promise you, they will love you for it forever. And everyone at your table will just have so much fun when they get that moment to shine. And at the end of the day, isn't having fun the reason that we're playing D&D? As for this character that we've built today, in the end, despite our lack of taunting frequency, with all of our heals, auras, treats, and other ways that we can buff and cure our allies, even if we're not the best tank at getting our enemies to attack us instead of our allies, we just might be the best character I've built to date at straight up protecting our allies and keeping them whole and hale and alive. And like I said in the preamble, that's kind of the point of playing a tank character in the first place, right? So under that criteria, this tank is really, really good at their job, and I think would just be an absolute blast to play for some massive mom and dad energy. But anyway, that's the build for the week. I hope you guys loved it. I had so much fun creating it. I know I say that every week, but it's also true every week in my defense. I hope you guys know that I love you because you're so awesome and I'm so grateful for you and all that you do for me and for this channel. I hope you have a fantastic day and a really great week, but if you don't, I hope you hang in there. I hope that you stay safe and that you be good and kind and that I see you again very soon. But until then, take care. Are we human, or are we dancer? My sign is vital, my hands are cold, and I'm on my knees looking for the answer. Are we human, or are we dancer? I have no idea what that line means. Hmm. I'll bet somebody watching knows or has a good idea. <laughs> I was play I was playing Guitar Hero with my son years ago and he was pretty little. And <laughs> I'm singing and playing the guitar and he's playing the drums. And that line comes up, are we human or are we dancer? And <laughs> and my son knocks. He just whispers under his breath, both. <laughs> and 
I don't know why it tickled me so, but it really did. I thought it was pretty sweet. If you love paladins, <clears throat> if you love playing, well, let's see. Well, I don't know. Don't say that. And I want to read, and I... <clears throat> anyway, let's... <laughs> anyway, well, don't say that, actually. With a shield and a plus one to armor class from the def from the defense fight, <laughs> Selune, or Solinari, or... <laughs> How do I say that name? 